uh, please, to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and verses 2, has been our theme for revival. God's Holy Spirit led me to this passage of Scripture, and now for a few services I've been preaching from it, as the Holy Spirit of God has unveiled to me some of the jewels that's in this passage of Scripture. I sense in the atmosphere of this place, the choir singing and all the great music and our great teaching, uh, we have a spirit of revival in this place, and I praise God for it. So I want you to uh, attend as much as you possibly can. You will run into some obstacles that would try to hinder you, but uh, if you'll just uh, pray, and say, God, I want to go. Please make a way for me. I'm sure he will make a way for me. So we'll look right here at our theme for revival. And I appreciate our youth and those that lead our youth and all the work that's been done on the property. Uh, thank you so very much. It just uh, all the cleaning says revival, doesn't it? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, 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 acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, you can prove this, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The first sin was committed in a garden you know the story in the book of Genesis. Even today, in every garden, there is a snake. There was a snake in that perfected garden where the first Adam fell in the captivity of sin by disobeying the first command of God. In these two verses, I can see a garden in these two verses. And not only can I see the garden in these two verses, I can still see the snake in the garden. Can, can you see it? You see, really, our lives are like a garden. A garden that has to be maintained. If you have a garden at your house, if you do not work in that garden and keep the filth out of it, the filth will take the garden. It will overpower the fruit that that garden could produce if somebody had a kept the weeds out. There's still a serpent that gets in the garden of our lives to destroy us, to make us aware over and over again we are living under a curse, the curse of sin. The garden of our lives spiritually has a purpose. And that purpose is to produce fruit and spiritual fruit. God said to Israel, I've loved you. I've worked with you. I have given you commandments to live by that you even agreed you would. And you haven't. And now you are an empty 
vine. What about your garden? What about your life? Are you keeping the weeds out? Are you keeping the filth out? It's hard work, isn't it? It seems like the Johnson grass can grow overnight. It'll look down the road sometimes if if somebody has slipped in and planted a bunch of it. We neglect our spiritual garden by conforming to the ways of this world. So we'll center in now on verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. The two words here is conformed and transformed. Everybody here in uh, the sound of my voice is in one category or the other. You're either conformed or you're transformed. Webster says, conform means to be similar, to obey the customs and the standards. Transform, Webster says, is to change in structure, appearance, and character. Conformed in the Greek means a fleeing of the fashion of this age. Transform means denoting change of condition. Involve the miracle and transforming from an earthly form into a supernatural. You ever experienced that? The word renewing means renewing which makes a person different than their past life. I, I, I am the best at it. No, nobody can compete with me. When I see a person, I, I can automatically see their outward appearance and I can pass a judgment on that person immediately. I can tell you after a couple of glances, if you ask me, I could say to you, they're worldly. Look at them. Look how they're dressed. And then I can look at a person that I would say is godly dressed. And if you ask me, I'd say, I won't tell you. I can tell by their appearance. Right there's a godly person. I can do it. I'm good at it. I see the tattoos all over people now. Boy, I'm good at it. They're worldly. How ungodly. Oh, it's awful. But they could have got the tattoos before they came to Christ. I went in a store this week. Beautiful young lady working the cash register. I walked over with the items. I handed her the money and I took the second look and I looked and in her nose it was pierced with something in it. I wanted so much to say, sweetie, you got a booger on the end of your nose. <laughs> it was a black diamond, I guess. I just wanted so much. Sweetie, you're in a public place. Everybody coming over here is looking at you. I can automatically pass judgment on her. She's a very worldly person. Very worldly. Boy, I remember in the days past when the men started with what we call long hair. Boy, I want to tell you, we can wear that now, can we? I, I mean, listen. You, every message you heard from a country preacher, it didn't matter what his text was, he can get on it. And we'll get on it. And then, God woke me up. 
I said, Frank, I want to define in your life what worldliness is. I said, Lord, I need your help. And when God dealt in my heart, I want to tell you, I discovered that the person that could pass judgment by the outward appearance is a very worldly person. If you're ready for it, say amen. Here's what God says to me. It means to do something other than the will of God in your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you don't do that, but you do something else. That's worldliness. Now, how many is with me? Say amen. amen. Where are you at now? And be not conformed to this world. Frank Hicks, every time you go to the farm, when the Holy Spirit of God has asked you to go witness to somebody, and you go on to the farm, you are a very worldly person. Well, kind of quiet, man. Revival is uh, transforming. The revival is uh, changing, changing our thought pattern. Okay, 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 okay. This verse tells us what not to do. And be not, underline it, be not, be not. You, me, be not conformed to this world. It's, it's, it's not so much in style, even though I believe in dressing right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't especially care for the low tops, ladies. It first represented a street woman. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have darkened the doors of a church years ago, but, but it's different now. It sure is, because we're all so worldly. Amen, Frank. Amen. These men putting these things in the lobes of their ear, I'm going to take, they're going to finally run out of the earlobe. <laughs> But we sit here in this assembly and we look at those and we pass in judgment and we sit here so worthy so worthy that God said don't, don't conform to this world and anything in your life boy I'm preaching now anything in your life that takes place to the leadership of God leading you I want to tell you, you can define it with one word. Right. Word. Word. So don't be conformed. Well, well, how can I get out of that? How, how can I stop doing what I'm doing? You have to reprogram the computer. You, you have to, to have a renewing, a renewing, a renewing, a renewing something that was once there that you hadn't worked on in a long time. It needs to be refreshed. The thought pattern needs to be changed. So you have the help of the Holy Spirit of God to renew your thinking. And you think like Jesus and then you live like Jesus. And that's when we have Holy Ghost sin. Old time sin killing revival. I, I learned Wednesday afternoon. One of our dear families. I, I, don't, I don't know how these people can sit with us. And hear the teaching and the preaching that God sends this place. And then go and join up with a false religion. It knocks me over folks. 
But I realize this, I can open, not open your heart. No, no, I, I can't do that. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm preaching like I'm persuading, but I can't open your heart. Charles Stanley said last night, I don't even know if we should call it a church or not. Maybe we should just label it an assembly. But he said, if you're a part of the church that does not believe in the Holy Spirit, Charles Stanley said, get out of it now. Right. Right. And then folks, are, there are even one church that calls themselves Christians. <laughs> that they do not believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. Hey, have they read this book? <laughs> Surely it's so simple, isn't it? That if you do not have the Holy Spirit of God in you, you are none of His. <laughs> it would be impossible for Frank Hicks with this sinful nature that's in me, that works on me all the time, it would be impossible for me to live for Jesus without the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just mark me off. If I ain't got it, I'm gone. <laughs> but with it, I'm an overcomer. So it's a renewing of the mind. When you get the renewing of the mind, then you can prove some things. <laughs> My Sunday school teacher taught me out of Nehemiah and the type of people that Nehemiah wanted. He wanted people that was faithful people. Now you'll either prove yourself faithful or you'll prove yourself unfaithful. If you prove yourself unfaithful, it's because you're conforming to the things of this world. Amen. Appreciate the amens, ladies. We don't get too many of them, but I appreciate it. <laughs> you might just want to say, oh me, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> you can prove something. You know what you'll prove? You'll prove what is that good. Yeah. It'll be good because it'll be spiritual. And it'll be acceptable. Boy, I'd like to know God accepts me. It can ex be acceptable in the eyes of God. And boy, we have trouble with that word perfect, don't we? I mean, we really like to ride, ride on that clutch. Well, now, preacher, I'm just not perfect. Well, are you trying to be? <laughs> This is the number one question. Preacher, if I just knew the will of God for my life, I'd do it. Right there it is in the Bible. One verse is all you need. That's the will of God for your life. Well, Jesus understood that when we walk through this world, we're going to pick up some garbage in this world. Jesus knew that when we walk through this world, that we're going to get our feet dirty by the things of this world. Traditionally, there was a basin of water in a dwelling house right at the front. And they had servants that served in that household. And as quick as you walked in there after walking across the land of Israel with the sand in your sandals and the dirt on your feet, you would sit down. And that servant would take a basin of water and they would wash your dirty feet. And they'd take a towel and they would dry and clean your feet. You wouldn't dirty all over. But your feet got dirty because you'd been walking through this old world. Jesus loved to break tradition of men. <laughs> Feast of the Passover. They've eat the meal. They've already eat the meal. That just they all they're they're all full now. And Jesus in that house walked over and got a basin of water and took his outer garment off that represents his flesh. He laid it aside and became what he came to do to serve. And he brought them old boys over one by one, even Judas. And he knew there's one that wouldn't clean. Judas got his feet washed, but he didn't get washed all over because he's a devil from the beginning. And Jesus 
the only perfect person that's ever lived. Yeah. With all of the holiness of God, all within him, expelled through flesh, an earthen vessel. And he started washing her feet. And of course it came Peter's time. And Peter said, oh Lord, you, you ain't going to do this, buddy. I mean, he knew, he didn't know, you know you're my king. You, you can't do this. No, get up from there. Dump that water. Put your coat back on. And Jesus said, Peter, I'm going to wash your feet. And he said, well now, Lord, let's have an understanding. If you're going to wash my feet, first of all, you need to wash me all over. I need, I need to wash it. And the Lord said, Peter, you don't really understand what I'm doing. Peter, I've already cleansed you. You've just been conforming to this world. You've just been walking through. You just picked up some stuff you really didn't intentionally maybe mean to. But in every garden, there is a snake. Most snakes I walk up on, I walk up on unaware. I want to tell you, if I'd have seen them, I'd have never walked there. And my reflex is quick. Even if they're dead. <laughs> if Bethlehem wants to have revival, God wants us to have revival. And I want to tell you, we're going to have to get this old worldly stuff washed off of our face. It's so not that we're not saved. You are saved. You're a great people. But you're a worldly people. And you prove. You prove by your witness that you're worthy. Now, yeah. now, yeah. Peter, I'm washing them, buddy. I'm washing them. Uh, can you imagine the marriage supper of the Lamb? Oh, Lord, how much I can. No. When it comes my turn, I'll, it's worse than Peter. Yeah. It, it'd be worse than that. To think of the Lord Jesus Christ and His perfection, making a sinner like me perfect. Jesus, let me wash yours. Let me wash yours. And that ought to be the attitude of every born again saved person. Because every one of us is a saved, is a bond servant or slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. That means it got me to fears, really. <laughs> I just ain't got a ring in it. <laughs> but this piercing is in the heart. And when the thinking in the heart gets right, man, my outside appearance will be all right. It'll be all right. And whatever the custom of the area is for Christian people in your appearance, that's the way we ought to join in. If they wear robes, and you go there to live, to witness for Christ, put you on the robe. Paul said, I become all things. <laughs> I can change a custom that's not sin for the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, Men, the example that I've given you right here in serving one another and forgiving one another, you do it to each other. That may, now, you won't have a great revival? Are, are there anybody here that you couldn't wash their feet? What about that one's kind of done you dirty? 
What about that one that got in your family? What about that one that run a tractor out in front of a road with a hay bale and no brakes? And <laughs> Kill my son-in-law. That when Camisa was born, I knew I was getting another boy just like him. And we was going to have a good time. And that nurse come out in the hallway of Bradley Memorial Hospital. She said, Mr. Hicks, you got a big old girl in there. I said, it ain't my baby. <laughs> I said, I've talked to the Lord about this. I've done this one by faith. Go back and look again. I'm supposed to have a boy. And when Lisa married Jason, Holy Spirit of God said, Frank, I gave you a girl. Now here's your boy. And her husband now is nothing but walking in the footsteps <laughs> of our favorite. And he's our favorite. But if that old boy was here this morning, and all the hurt that my family went through, I can tell you with all my heart this morning, I can wash his feet. I can wash them. And to Jacob, whose daddy he's never seen, Jacob, if he is here today, Me and you, son, we can wash his feet. We can wash his feet. Why? Because we need to revive. Can I read it to you one more time? And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Let's stand together.